Hey everyone, it is Kevin Henry. I'm the editor in chief for drbycuspid.com, and welcome back to another edition of the drbycuspid.com podcast. Thrilled today to be joined by Josh DeBreeze, who is the founder and CEO of Intivio. Hey Josh, how are you today? Very well. Thank you for having me on the podcast today, Kevin. Hey. Appreciate it. Glad to have you on. I'm excited to talk about a, a benchmark report that you guys did. It really talks about patient engagement. I thought there were some really interesting things in there. But before we dive into that, I want our audience to just know a little bit more about you and Intivio, if you don't mind. Yeah. So uh, my name is Joshua DeVries. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Intivio. Uh, we're a patient engagement platform for healthcare professionals, really focusing on uh, healthcare professionals with complicated communication needs. This may be due to a group of patients that have multiple languages that you need to communicate in. This may be due to treatments that you provide are more complex and require further instructions or more complex care, um, or even for a super GP office that's dabbling a little bit of, you know, uh, major treatments or restorative and really cares about patient engagement, rebooking rates, and all sort of other metrics that make the, the office tick. Well, and I want to talk about this report because I, I think patient engagement is so important, especially as we're in the fourth quarter of the year as we record this. Uh, you know, because we know all those patients are going to come back in for insurance needs and try to get in under the wire. So I think it's a perfect time to talk about this. And the report is, and let me just make sure I get this right, Dental Patient Engagement 2024 Benchmark Report. And I know one of the things that you all really discussed in here was how important text messaging is now in today's dental practice. Was there anything in there that surprised you about the amount of text or the way that consumers are using text messages to talk to those dental practices? Yeah, definitely. There's there's quite a bit there. But I think even more surprisingly, as we approach this whole project, is that we kind of just assumed there was a report out there already, that there was some leader in the space that was, you know, releasing this information. Um, and it wasn't until, you know, we looked into this and we saw there was no one actually speaking towards patient engagement. There was no active benchmark. And, you know, I feel as a leader in this space, servicing over 3,000 individual locations in healthcare. Uh, we have an obligation to share our findings and our results. So I think the first thing was there was actually no tracking mechanism. Everyone was dealing on antidote or my consultant told me this or my friend's office does that. Um, so we felt an obligation to actually transparently display the data as we see it. Um, so that was the first thing. I think the second thing, what we saw probably about 10 years ago, we ran this data internally, was there was a large discrepancy across age demographic. Um, historically, it had been, um, you know, people that may be more senior, people that were dealing with assisted living, um, were less likely to use texting or less likely to have a smartphone or want to engage in that way. And that's definitely shifted. Um, we have seen almost identical usage rates on the senior, which we consider over 65 and above age demographic than we are seeing in between, you know, the 30 and 50 range. Um, so that has changed quite rapidly. And we're also noticing is um, there's more living arrangements. Um, so we're having more separated families that need to communicate, you know, shared pay, uh, child responsibilities for child care, uh, not necessarily having the responsible parent be the primary caregiver and therefore having you know, complicated communication requirements that need to be addressed, um, as well as people that are insisted living. They may not have um, someone who's family or responsible member who's dealing with their health care needs. Um, so, yeah, those are kind of the surprising ones around the age demographic that's really shifted. There's a lot more seniors or elderly patients using texting, wanting this type of technology because it's easier for them to read and see. They can make the font bigger than it is to necessarily hear on a phone call um, or to access their email. Um, so, yeah, those are the two big surprises for me. Well, I've got to be honest with you. I'm glad that you all are helping bust this myth about seniors not using technology, because I think that that is something that as our population ages, we've seen, you know, the uh, the grab on to technology as well. I know, you know, my mom is in her early 80s and Facebook is the way that she communicates with all of her friends, keeps up with her granddaughter, everything else. But I also know she texts with her dental practice about appointments and everything. So I think this is a really important thing for our audience to know. Yeah, I mean, the phone is not the most accessible means of communication or engagement. It, it, it had its time and its place when we were limited with mobility, but that really has shifted in the last 10 years where um, even underserved communities have access to cell phones. Uh, we're seeing that for sure on the academic side where they're dealing with a lot of Medicaid patients, patients who do not have the resources to go to a private clinic. 
uh, may rely on government support, even they are communicating with cell phones, even they have uh, access to texting and, you know, are much more responsive through that means of trans, uh, through that communication. You know, I know one of the areas that you dove into into this report was oral maxillofacial surgery uh, and, and the OMS praxis. And there was a surprising stat in there to me, and I wanted to get your take on this. Those specialty praxis send more than 2,000 text messages to patients monthly. Uh, and, and I think that that is really a key thing to know in this is that this isn't something that's just a drip in the bucket. This is really a key part of that communication line between patients and the practice as well. Especially when you think about the overall volume of patients coming in and out of the clinic is much smaller on an oral surgery level. Um, you know, to be honest, whether you're an oral surgeon or a GP, you know, communicating the needs of that very first appointment, uh, we found a couple of things to be true in our 15 years uh, working at Intibio. So the first thing is uh, patients have a remarkable ability to block out noise today that they've ever had. Um, the moment something smells fishy, it seems like it's spam or it's a robot or, you know, people just kind of get distracted and disengaged from that right off the hop. And what we really pinpoint is there's three things you need to always be uh, cognizant of. A is all your communication needs to be relevant to the appointment or the reason they're coming. Why are they there? Uh, each one of those communication points should be specific from the other to stay relevant, to stay important, to stay top of mind. Um, the next thing is everything we want has to be actionable. There's a reason that you're touching base with the patient. Uh, it's not to see how they're doing. It's because you need to collect these forms, get that information, get these images or x-rays. Um, and the third thing is it needs to be timely. So message patients when you need what, you, when you want what you need. And what I mean to say is get your forms two weeks before, remind them of their pre-meds two hours before. Timeliness is super important, but really relevance, actionability, and timeliness are, are critical to effective patient engagement. Uh, the other thing that we found is that we often leverage what we call micro agreements. So often dentists will say, or front desks will say, uh, my patients think I'm texting them too much. And when they do an audit of their way they're communicating, they're only texting two or three times, they're sending two or three emails, which I think everyone can agree isn't that much, especially for a surgery. Um, what we found was patients are actually meaning you're sending me too much of the exact same message. It's three messages that are exactly the same with all the information. What we've done and what we've seen to be a solution is actually breaking it up into eight to 12 different messages. And along the customer journey from when they book that appointment to when that procedure takes place, uh, leverage the, 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 the rule of micro agreements by getting them to agree to a bunch of small things so by the time that surgery comes up, they've already said yes six or seven times before then, and now they're finally just doing those final steps to ensure the surgery or that complex treatment is being done successfully. Um, so although patients are saying you're sending me too many messages, what we found is actually you need to send them more messages. They just need to be relevant, they need to be actionable, and they need to be timely. And I'm guessing you also need to be communicating about those messages ahead of time, letting them know that they're coming, letting them know why they're important, because I think as long as you plant that seed with the patient, they're not going to think, oh, this is too much, or why are they contacting me, or whatever it might be. I mean, I always tell that just this is in our heart of hearts. If we look at that email that goes out, you know, the day before the surgery, and you were to think of all the instructions they need to do, all the things that they may have already forgotten, it might just be easier to be sick, um, you know, and that's our fault. That's not actually the patient's fault. We, as the caregivers, are responsible for clear and effective communication and ensuring that patient shows up prepared. Because either we haven't communicated the importance or the urgency of this treatment, so they're not taking it seriously. Um, we haven't broken down what's required in bite-sized, manageable chunks. Um, or somewhere along the way, things got fallen in, through the gaps. And uh, it's actually on the care provider's job to eliminate those miscommunications and to make sure, uh, because this is a new... Uh, hopefully not a frequent type of procedure for many of these patients, that they're not expected to be in the driver's seat. They don't know what they don't know. Uh, and we have to be that educator. We have to turn patients from being subjects of treatment plans, but being partners in their oral health. And that's really critical, I think, as we move forward to this new world, this digital world of engagement, but also this digital world of finding healthcare providers that meet our needs. And I want to point out one other stat that really jumped out to me was that average confirmation rates across all praxis are between 76 to 78%. So about four out of five patients are confirming their appointments. And I'm curious, 
How do you view that number? Do you view that number as there's still some work to be done whenever it comes to that confirmation process and making sure patients understand the importance of it? Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest one is we're clearly not, you know, engaging at the level where we're getting 100% penetration. I think, you know, as that remains to be true, we need to find new and different ways of making sure that message is delivered. Um, I do believe that a lot of offices um, know which patients are going to be a little more trickier to get a hold of, and they make a bigger effort to get confirmations from those patients than necessarily other ones which will make it seem a little bit lower than what you would think it would be. Um, but I do believe, you know, there's still a huge room for improvement for us to communicate the need for this information. And it comes down to, is, you know, pre-planting that seed of two days before we're going to message you. And, you know, if you can't make that appointment, that's the time to definitively say yes or no. Uh, planting that seed is going to help understand from the patient's point of view why that's urgent. And what are some of the consequences if they don't do that? Maybe we have a fine that we have to impose. Um, maybe it means we're going to have the chair time empty and, you know, Susan, uh, the hygienist, isn't going to have a full schedule that day. Uh, find some sort of way that the patient actually um, understands the consequence of not confirming. Because, yeah, obviously we're having confirmation and no-show rates much below 20%, hopefully, for a lot of offices. Um, but we are hearing that that has increased quite significantly over the past four years. Um, so I definitely think there's, there's more work to be done. And last question for you. And, and we touched on this earlier, but again, we're recording this in the fourth quarter of the year. And we know that sometimes these patients haven't been in for a while. So it feels like now communication around that confirmation is more important than ever, because we know how scarce those appointments can be in the fourth quarters. Everybody tries to get back in for insurance purposes. Yeah, I think, you know, there's always two ways of looking at the problem. And I think as healthcare providers, we often look at it in, uh, you know, the light of what do we have scheduled for tomorrow for production? What do we, you know, what's going to be completed for tomorrow for production? Um, and then maybe some dentists are actually viewing back and saying, what's my total utilization share rate or chair utilization rate? Um, as, you know, a little bit higher view of maximum potential revenue within a day. Uh, what a lot of offices are missing are, over no fault of the patient's own or really no fault of the office's staff's own, but patients have fallen through the cracks. They actually aren't even booked for that next appointment. And what we've really tried to stress the importance of, of building in a catch-all, whether it be a report from your practice management software that you call through manually, or maybe you email blast them to get them re-engaged, but finding those patients who haven't committed that next appointment and finding a way to bring them back into the cycle of care. And one of the things that we recommend is often it's a simple email or text messages. You know, we know you haven't been here in a while. Uh, we really want to make sure you're having the top quality oral care that you can get. That is part of, you know, maintaining a regular cleaning or hygiene sequence. If you found someone else, please let us know. We want to pass over your records to them. However, if you simply forgot, we wanted to re-engage you to book some time in over the next three months. But like finding those patients who actively are kind of like ghosts, they, they haven't, actively committed in maybe over a year and they have nothing scheduled over the next year that is the hugest opportunity uh for you because likely they've just forgotten and something's going to remind them and it might be their friend talking about a new dentist they just went to that was really great rather than your email reminding them they haven't been there in a while um and we are competing there is less loyalty in patient demographics today than there was 20 years ago um sure. we're hearing that way more often there's not these offices where uh, we're a mature practice, not looking to grow. Um, I don't hear that anymore. Josh, I know that this is some great information, and I want to make sure our audience knows where to find it and maybe where to find out more about Intivio as well. Yeah, so I think the best way is going to our websites, connecting with us on social, Intivio, I-N-T-I-V-E-O dot com. Um, we also do have a podcast. It's called the Patient Experience Blueprint. We have a lot of guests on that podcast talking about some of these challenges, metrics, KPIs ways to improve, uh, you know, your engagement across your practice. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, at Intimio, we feel the obligation being a market leader as being transparent about some of these results that we're seeing and help educate the market as a whole to improve patient engagement. So uh, definitely stay tuned. You know, we share the results of over 70 million message reminders, uh, almost 40 million patients that we're communicating with every single year. Um, and hopefully it's providing really great insights for those that are paying attention. I think there's been some good insights uh, discussed today, and we'll make sure to put the link 
to Intivio in the show notes to make sure that you'll be able to find this report. You can download it for yourself. But Josh, hey, thanks so much for the time today. I really do appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Pleasure. Absolutely. And thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of the DrByCuspid.com podcast. Hey, fourth quarter of the year, now is the time to really be thinking about how you're communicating with those patients and making sure that you're communicating with them in the right way as well. Until next time, it's Kevin Henry, Editor-in-Chief for Dr. By Cuspid, signing off, and as always, wishing you nothing but success ahead.